So like I said, I record everything so that if you miss class, it'll be uploaded to YouTube usually by you know, four or five o'clock. I told my other classes two or three o'clock and that did not happen yesterday. So uh, for those of you who do not have the syllabus, it's on D2L. Um, you can get it via your D2L email because I sent it out the other day. You can get it in the um, announcements, the front page of D12 for this class, and it's under the content tab. So, I'm Dr. Sherman. Where is my office? I hate this building. Other side of the building, just fine. The office block over there. Um, go into the office block, take a left, take a right, take a right, back in the corner, pick call 352. Notice I don't give a phone number because even if I'm in my office, I don't answer the phone because I get so much spam calls. Um, I literally don't answer. Um, and I should have done that, forgot to. Don't use that email address to try to get in touch with me. Use the D2L email for the class, okay? That's because if you use the D2L link, um, all students' messages will be threaded by that class. If you use this, your messages just get buried in literally the scores of email I get every day, most of which are spam, so I'm just sitting there deleting and sometimes I don't look real carefully at the subject line. 99% of the time it's not important. Um, and I'm usually connected online, sad to say, 12 to 16 hours a day. So if you email me, you'll hear back from me usually within an hour or two. Uh, office hours, roughly 7.15. I'll probably usually be here by 7, but depending upon traffic, um, 7.15 to 7.50 a.m., Monday through Friday, and by appointment. So this course is the experience of literature. I usually just call it intro to literature. This is the textbook. This is the 11th edition. If you get the 10th edition, that's OK. okay? Um, I put the 10th edition page numbers in all, all throughout the syllabus also. But the 11th edition, the bookstores hassle me. It's easier for them. Well, it used to be easier for them to get. Now it even is out of print and might be a little harder to find. Uh, you can get the 10th edition on Amazon, or you used, last year, you could for 10, 15 bucks, okay? Um, and you will, you need it for the literary terms and definitions that are buried throughout the textbook. Everything literature-wise, poems, plays, short stories, that we um, read this semester is available online. Okay? In fact, two of the things we're gonna read, um, you'll see when we get to it, I've given you PDFs, links to PDFs for them. So we're gonna use those rather than, for one of them, what is in the textbook, okay? Disclaimer, we might, I might have to revise the syllabus, um, might get behind, you know, last week was shot entirely, I've already revised it a little bit. Uh, something like that happens again, I'll start dropping dropping things. Uh, or, no, I can't say that. I was gonna say, or have you watched stuff online, but MTSU has a policy, which a lot of other schools do not have, that if the university's closed, we can't ask you to watch something online. UT, the university is closed, you go online. Okay. I don't understand it, but that's the way it is. Um, any changes I'll make in class, and I don't say that, but I will post the D2L. This part, this is really important, not just for this class. I mean, this is just generally while you're at MTSU, I would check your D2L in the morning, first thing. Other professors might do this. Um, if I've got to cancel class, I'll let you know by 6.30 so that if this is your first class of the morning, you'll know plenty of time um, before you have to leave to get here. Unless you're doing like I've had a couple of students do before, unless you're traveling up from Huntsville or Birmingham or something like that, um, not many do. 
Okay. So check D2L. I'll send it to both your email and the um, announcement page. Students with disabilities, you know who you are, you know what you need to do. Do that so that I will know what I need to do. Cell phones, laptops, all that kind of stuff. Um, don't. <laughs> For the cell phones, do, you know, if I see you and your hands are underneath your desk and you're rapidly, you're doing one of two things, neither of which are really appropriate here. So just don't. Um, similarly, somewhere down here, I've got, I'm not picking on anybody, I've got something about um, headphones, earbuds, take them out when you come in, put them back in when you leave. That's fine, just don't keep them on in class. I've literally you know, had classes before where I am competing with somebody with their beats on that are almost louder than me. And that's, that's pretty hard. I've had complaints before from people on the other side of the building hearing me. Because some of this stuff I'll get a little excited, agitated, whatever, enthusiastic about, okay? Um, if you're a first responder, EMT, fire, police, ambulance, whatever, let me know. I've only had one or two in 31 years of teaching that were, but let me know and I'll say just keep your phone out, put it on vibrate. If it vibrates and you look at it and you get up, no questions asked. Okay? The rest of this or this part is really the more, the more slash most important part. If you've got some kind of family relational situation going on, and by that I mean a health situation. I don't mean, you know, you and your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, you know, on the rocks or something like that. Something happens and someone who's close to you gets, you know, hit by a car or injured somehow or medical diagnosis that is, you know, life altering, let me know. You don't have to let me know immediately, but let me know within 48 hours. And the only reason I bring this up is it's happened every semester for at least the last 10 years. Someone comes in, somebody in the family has been diagnosed with cancer, it's terminal, you know, et cetera. Here's why that's important. If you let me know now or as soon as it happens, because it may be middle of March or something like that, I'll do everything I can to help you finish this course successfully. Doesn't mean, you know, give you all A's kind of a thing. But it may mean you, you can't come anymore. I've had students before who have had to stop attending so that they could be at the hospital with loved ones or roommates kind of a thing. If I know that ahead of time or I know that shortly after it happens, I'll make it so that maybe you don't have to be here, okay? If, however, something like that happens and you wait until the second week of April, God forbid it happens next week, we're in January, and you don't let me know until April, I'll say, you know, I'm really sorry to hear that, I'll pray for you, your family, whatever, but I can't do anything about all the assignments, et cetera, you've missed at that point. And again, that has happened also. Last time I taught in the fall, not last fall, the year before, um, I had a student who stopped showing up mid-September. And literally, the like Monday after Thanksgiving, I, I get an email. Sorry, Dr. Sherman, I haven't been there for a little bit, like two and a half months, you know, but I, I couldn't do anything at that point, right? So let me know. Um, if you use a laptop for taking notes, that's fine. I really don't encourage it. I don't include the links to studies that pretty conclusively show if you take notes with, by hand, um, that material sticks a lot better than otherwise, okay? Um, what else? If you're using a laptop, cell phone, or whatever for something not to do with class, I'll give you a couple of examples. Facebook, Pornhub. I've actually had a student, this was a couple of years ago, uh, who another student came up to me after and says, Dr. Sherman, can you speak to, because you know, so-and-so was streaming porn the entire class, okay? I'm pretty sure, it's been a few years since I've looked at the student handbook, I'm pretty sure that's cause for automatic expulsion. Not 
from the class, MTSU, you're out. Okay? At the very least, you lose your electronic privileges. You won't have access to the Wi-Fi. Just throwing that out there. Um, okay. Classroom decorum. All that means is behavior. Okay? Common standards of decency. Try to get here on time. Um, I don't know about this one yet. The other classroom I'm teaching in, the door lock seems to be a little wonky. It's supposed to stay unlocked. It used to be. They would stay unlocked for 15 minutes after I swipe. The other classroom I'm teaching in, it's locking within five minutes. Um, I'm not going to stand here and walk to the door and go open it every minute for 20 minutes after class begins. Probably five to 10 minutes after class begins, I'll wave. But I'm probably not going to open it. If one of you, out of the kindness of your heart, wants to go open it, I won't tell you not to, but try to be here on time. If you have a class before this and you're all the way on the other side of campus, let me know. In that case, I'll probably give you some slack. Okay. Um, what else? If I'm speaking, you're quiet. If someone else is speaking, you're quiet, etc. I do encourage, you know, I'll ask a lot of questions. I do encourage responses. I usually don't get any. Okay, you know, whatever. Um, be courteous to each other when speaking in class. Use language appropriate to the, to the setting. No swearing or foul language. I will use damn and hell and every now and then a shit, but that's the worst. No worse than that. No sexual innuendo, no racial, you know, you, you get the idea, okay? Um, don't eat. You got a smoothie, you got a Coke, you got a Red Bull, whatever, that's fine. Big bag of crunchy Doritos or Cheetos, don't, because the people next to you will start going into fits. Don't sleep, because if you do, I'll probably, if you're up at the front, do this. Um, which I've literally done before, or I've done two or three times. I'll just very quietly say, "Let's sleep," and we'll just let the person sleep it off. You know, um, don't do that as much because every the every class is packed with stuff I'm trying to cover. Don't do homework assignments for other classes in here. You know, don't when you come into this class. You should have this with you. Don't come in and pull out a biology textbook or accounting or principles of flying or whatever. Again, students have done that. I've told them to leave. And I'll usually wait until you just pack that shit up and leave. Um, don't wear headphones, earbuds, as I said. Don't cheat or plagiarize. Goes without saying. Uh, come prepared. That is, come having read the material. Come with the textbook, et cetera, okay? Uh, do we dress on drill? Failure to commit, why do I keep saying that? To complete or submit three or more quizzes and or failure to submit an examination, and there should, hmm, should be another phrase in here, or other written assignment will result in failure of the course. There's gonna be a lot of quizzes. There'll be at least one a week, okay? So that's 13, 14 quizzes at least. Sometimes there might be two. Um, this is how I'm taking role. I'm not gonna spend time in class going down the list. You're, you don't take the quiz, you're absent, all right? You miss three of those, you failed the course, all right? Just make sure everybody's clear. They're all online. They'll all be on D2L. Um, great, exams will be on D2L, the quizzes will be on D2L. The final exam might have a written component, um, essay-like thing that the others will not, okay? Semester grade is real easy to calculate. I just take the total number of points you've earned and divide it by the total number of points possible. Nothing is weighted more heavily than something else, okay? Every quiz, eh, I take that back, nearly every quiz will have some extra credit on it. <coughs> um, 
Every exam will have some extra credit. Okay. Quizzes, five to 10 points possible extra credit. Exams, 10 to 30 points. I've literally had students who, let's say, you know, the total number of quiz points possible is 130, ended up with 170 or 180 points because of the extra credit possibilities. So to fail this course, you've really got to work. You have to excel at failing in order to do that. Every semester, some try and succeed. So just you know, be uh, forewarned about that. Um, do I have comments about quizzes and stuff? No, I don't. So a little bit about quizzes and exams. Like I said, they'll be on D2L. Um, except for maybe a written component on the, the final exam, they'll be entirely objective. Not multiple choice. There might be one or two that are multiple choice in terms of quizzes, but fill in the blank, short answer, that kind of thing. But they're not going to be asking you to interpret what XYZ means. They're going to be kind of factual based. Who wrote what? What's the name of the character? Who? You know, why? You know, what does so-and-so give to? There'll be plot, that kind of thing, which is what we'll be going over in class. All the quizzes will become available usually the last day we finish talking about something or maybe even the day before that to a couple days after. For the quizzes, you'll have minimum of minimum window of opportunity to take the quiz of 48 hours, two days. That means it'll open, say, 11.59 one day and close maybe 11.59 two days later. Usually, they'll be open more like four to seven days. Okay? The quiz, however, you'll have anywhere from, I'm just kind of thinking through my mind of the quizzes because I've already got them all set up. Usually, you'll have about 10 minutes. There might be one or two that are 15 to 20 minutes. Those will be longer quizzes, 15 to 20 questions. Most of the quizzes will require one or two word answers for each question. Okay? You get one attempt for each quiz. The quizzes are timed. They've changed something to D12 since the last time I taught. I was off last um, fall because I was on medical leave. I had my shoulder replaced. Um, last time I taught in spring, when I set up a quiz, I could do a time limit and then I could arrange it for there to be a grace period. So let's say you had 10 minutes. But then you'd have two grace minutes to actually get it finished. So in reality, it was 12 minutes. But when you started it, it showed 10 minutes count or whatever. I can't do that anymore. Now it's just 10 minutes either allow you to keep going, so the timer means nothing until whenever you finish, or it stops. And it records what you've done at that point. Well, it stops. Okay, It's not going to be um, going on forever. <clears throat> Same with exams. Exams, I think the minimum amount of time is something, shut up Siri, is something like 75 minutes. Most of you, I will bet, based on past experience, will have it done in about 20 to 25. They're usually 50 questions or so. Okay? And again, most of those are short answer. Exams are largely based upon the quizzes. Take questions, modify some a little bit, add other questions from the class and readings and things like that. And, and the quizzes and exams are based upon the assigned readings of what we talked about in class. Okay? Um, let me rephrase that. No, not that kind of covers it. Assigned readings, like for example, um, the stuff that's in the syllabus. But when we get to poetry, I'm going to talk about, you know, say, open your books and turn to, and we're going to talk about a poem that isn't on the syllabus on some days when we're talking about poetic techniques or poetic terms, okay? Those poems will also show up. That's why I say anything discussed in class, okay? Um, so, grading, like I said, is real easy. However many points you earn, 
divided by the total number of points possible. And again, with extra credit, there's usually all told somewhere about 100, 120 points possible of just extra credit. Extra credit is just based upon the reading stuff, you know, in class, okay? So, this last part, and then we'll do some of this and maybe get into, no, I don't think we will. Um, I was just trying to look around, see if I saw any books anywhere, but I don't. <coughs> so, two sets of pages in the, in the syllabus. The first set, so for example, this right here, writing about fiction. The first set of pages, the set before the semicolon, refers to the pages in the 11th edition. The second set of pages, 57 to 76, refer to the pages in the 10th edition. I had to start doing this about a year ago because of the numbers of students I'd have showing up with the 10th edition. Because, not Phillips, what's the other bookstore across Greenland? Uh, yeah, textbook brokers. Would order the 10th edition. They don't contact me about what book you're using. They send somebody over to Phillips or get online. Um, but they would order the 10th edition. So I started including both. So if you get the 10th edition, you'll be able to follow along just perfectly. Notice when we get down to next week. Um, I've got a couple of links. When we do Flannery O'Connor's, a good man is hard to find. The material you read is in the textbook. This is a link to a sound file of her reading the story. And the way she reads it, it's humorous. Most people don't read A Good Man is Hard to Find as being humorous. It's about a mass murderer who escapes from a penitentiary and I'm gonna give away something, and kills a bunch of people. Real funny, right? Well, the way she reads it's kind of this droll, dry humor with this thick southern drawl. She's from Milledgeville, Georgia, all right? Anyways, so if you want to hear her take on it, you can click that, because that's going to be very, very different than mine. Then the other two things, um, when we get to drama, we're going to talk about Sophocles, Greek author, and you've got the introduction to him on these pages. And then I've given this link for Oedipus the King. Oedipus the King is in this book, but it's not the Richard Fagel's translation. It's Richard Green or Richmond Lattimore, one of those two. I prefer this translation. It reads easier. It's more fluid. It's more eloquent. It sounds better, right? It's got more punch at certain spots. And Oedipus is a play that is full of a lot of punch. Anybody know anything about Oedipus? He was a guy who, when he was born, just before he was born, his parents received a prophecy. The prophecy is, the child that is in you, talking to the mother, is fated to kill you, the father, and marry you, and sleep with you, and have children by you, the mother. They both said, hell no, okay? Baby was born. Father drives a stake, a pin, between the kid's ankles, so from like the right leg through the left ankle. The name Oedipus means club foot. Bone forms around those wounds. He gets left on a mountain to die. Someone picks him up, takes him off to another town. He gets raised by the king and queen there. They're at a party, and some drunk stands up and calls him a bastard, meaning literal bastard. You're not your father's child. He asks his parents, they say, he's a drunk, don't worry about it. It drives him crazy. He goes to an oracle, someone who speaks for the gods, and the oracle tells him, you are fated to kill your father, sleep with your mother, and bring to light a brood of children that should never see the light of day. You know, Your sons and daughters will be your sisters and brothers. He's like, hell no. 
runs away. What's the point? Can you escape fate? Do we have free will? Okay. Because in running away, he causes everything that is prophesied to happen. Why? He's missing information. He doesn't know what he needs to know in order to escape his fate. So, we're going to read Fagel's translation of Oedipus the King. Then we're going to do Sophocles's. There's three plays in this cycle, in this trilogy. We're going to read Antigone. Antigone is about one of Oedipus's daughters slash sisters. Daughter and I get what? Half sister? No, it'd be full sister. Hmm. That's kind of weird. Anyways, in her coming up against the authority of the state. See, a lot of people say, why do I have to take this course? It's irrelevant to my major and to my life. Well, if you ever have a conflict with the state, okay, IRS, whatever, police, okay, you're in Antigone's shoes because the play begins with her brother, one of her brothers, take that back, both of her brothers dying. One of them is dying defending the state. The other one is dying attacking the state. He wants to be king. So they kill each other in battle. The brother who dies defending the state gets full military funeral, like Arlington, the thing down Pennsylvania, you know, whole nine yards. The other brother, the king says, will lie rotting in the open until the birds and the dogs devour him. And she's like, no. The gods in their unwritten and unshakable laws demand a proper burial. It, the proper burial, her argument, is demanded for everyone. It doesn't matter whether an enemy or a friend, okay? Where's the problem? Who do you obey? Do you obey the gods? Conscience? Or do you obey the state? What happens when the state tells you to do something you don't want to do? All of you men in here, if you try to get financial aid or anything, what little form do you have to sign still, even though we haven't had one of these things in over 50 years, You've got to register with Selective Service so that should some major massive war erupt, you can be drafted. What if you don't want to go fight the Houthis in Yemen or in Ukraine, say something all hellish breaks loose? What, who are you going to obey? The state or your own internal compass? Well, as a writer, Sophocles was wrestling with that issue 2,500 years ago. Still as relevant today, <laughs> if not more than it was then. Plus you have in this one, a woman standing up against the king. And women in fifth century Greece were nothing. I mean, nothing, nothing. And you'll hear the language in the play, the king, he feels like his masculinity is being challenged. And she just plays on that. Antigone does. Okay, So, I think those are the only two things. Not take that back. There are a couple others down here. Where'd you go? Down here. A couple other links. That's a sound file. Simon and Garfunkel song. And then there's like three other poems um, with links that I want you to read. All right? So, go back. Actually, no, I can leave that up. For, for, what's today? Today's Tuesday. I've got all my days mixed up. Um, for Thursday, you need to have finished. The minister's black veil by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I'm not getting ready to stop right here. We're going to talk a little bit about some of these terms and uh, what to note in reading these pages. But you need to have read the short story, Minister's Black Veil. It's only eight pages, right? In the little brief introduction. 
You'll notice for just about everything, like Hawthorne, you got one set of pages and another set of pages. Those are all in the 11th edition, and then these are all in the 10th edition. The first set of pages is brief biographical stuff about Nathaniel Hawthorne. The second set of pages, that's the story. So Faulkner, that's about Faulkner's background. That's the short story, same thing, um, with other writers and works later on, all right? It's a fairly short, short story. I don't want you to read it and sit there for two hours trying to think, ooh, what's the deep symbolism of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just read it. Be familiar with it. Know who the characters are, okay? Read it carefully, but just that. We'll talk about the symbolism and that kind of thing, because I'm not going to tell you what the veil, the minister's black veil, means. I'll throw out possibilities, because none of us know exactly what Hawthorne meant by it. It, it points to a bunch of different things. Okay? So let's get back to this then. The first set of pages that I've got assigned, reading imaginative literature. That's what the section's called in both sets of books. Why? Well, because um, Meyer, the editor of your book, Meyer is assuming that you think or realize, know, whatever terminology you want to use, that reading this kind of literature is different than reading, that's all imaginative, than this kind of literature. But, okay, granted, that's not really literature, it's a poster. But it's writing, and so some people are, yes, it is literature. Well, what's the difference? Or, you know, take another class in your major, whatever your major is. You've probably got something that you have to read that is not like reading a short story. What's the difference between reading a short story and reading, a, I don't know, an accounting textbook or a biology or chemistry textbook? What are you getting from those that you're not getting from this short story? Do you read this for facts? No. Are there facts in it? Yes. The place where it is set is a fact. But you're not reading it to gain knowledge, per se. You can gain knowledge about the poem, but not knowledge that you will then somehow you know, punch into a keyboard or apply in your life. You will gain truths. You will gain wisdom. You will gain understanding from these that you don't go to an accounting textbook for, right? An accounting textbook doesn't tell you how to live your life. Just about all of this stuff, in one way or another, does. Maybe how to live a better life, how to improve your life, how to see things that you don't normally see. Because for right now, every one of you sees something I don't see. Every one of you has a perspective. I'm trying to make this happen without happening. Every one of you sees something I don't see. If I hold this up and say, what do you see? Don't tell me what it is. Tell me what you see. Describe what you see without telling me what it is. Is it round? No. Is it light? Dark? It's showing nothing there. Is there something on it? Let's see if that happens. So somebody tell me what you see. Anybody? Sunset. Sunset. It's a sunrise, actually, but good guess. Sunrise. What are you, an idiot? There's no sunrise there. Why can't I say that? The wallpaper is just doing what you said that. Okay. Yes, it is. Because I don't see a sunset like this. Now you don't see a sunset or sunrise. So now tell me what you see. A rectangle. Good, I see that. Are you blind? There's no circle there. What's the point? Your perspective is different than mine. Whether oppositionally like this 
Or if I had one of you come up here and stand right here and I stood right here, it would be really close, but not the same. So one of the things literature does is it takes us outside our shoes and puts us just ever so slightly in somebody else's. Or in the case of, I lost them, Edifice, it takes us outside our what? 2024. And puts us back in 5th century BC Greece. So you couldn't have this play today. Why? A lot of people say, hey man, who you sleep with? Doesn't really matter. Ancient Greece said, yes it does. <laughs> You don't sleep with your daughter, or mother, or sister, or brother, or whatever, okay? All, all of these works are going to do that kind of thing, all right? So, it's why we read this. How many of you, now I'm not going to ask this question because I don't want to put any, anybody on the spot. I used to ask this question in my, in my classes. How many of you read regularly, like for fun? And I would have a few, you know, throw up, and I'd say, what do you read? And some would say, you know, Sports Illustrated or some magazine or maybe a book or novel, whatever. I mean, you watch TV, whatever it is. If it's, if it's any kind of sitcom or regular show, you're just watching literature for the eyes. Because every one of those shows has what? Even so-called reality TV has what? A script. It's all scripted out. Okay. That means there's stuff to follow. It has, there's plot. Beginning, middle, end. That's not what plot means. Plot means the arrangement of incidents in a story. That's all it means, okay? So all of these sets of phrases, or, or all of these sets of pages, okay, are sections in the book about, for example, plot. Pages 66 to 106. On those, what, 40 pages or so are, this is off the top, top of my head, are probably a dozen, maybe two dozen terms that in your book will be in bold print. Those are the terms you need to know. Those are the terms you need to understand. What I used to do in this class, a few years back, I stopped doing it, is we would spend the first couple days just going through, and I'd say, turn to page, 66, and you had turned a page, whatever. Page 197, third person narrator, this is for point of view. And I'd say stream of consciousness, and then would literally read the passage about what it means. I'm not going to do that, because you're in college, you can read it on your own. But we will talk briefly about it. So, plot. There's these bold-faced terms. How is a plot arranged? Can be arranged chronologically is one of the terms. Or in medius race, chronologically, beginning, middle, 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 end. How can a plot begin in the middle? Yeah, by starting in the middle and then flashing back. How many have seen any of the Star Wars films? Some of you have at least, okay? Specifically, the one released in 1977. Was that the first Star Wars film? It's the first one released. Within George Lucas's, you know, mind, it's what? It's, it's in the middle. Okay? How many of you saw the, the Lord of the Rings films? The first one doesn't begin with a long expected party which is the way the Lord of the Rings novel begins. It begins with these images on the screen. And then you hear Kate Blanchett's voice as Galadriel. And she narrates what we're seeing. Why? Because that's a whole bunch of information that you need to know in order for the long expected party to make any sense. Because if you have no idea what the ring is, you won't know what Gandalf's talking about at the beginning. Well, Tolkien does that in the novel by starting with the party and then we get chapter two of book one 
The Fellowship of the Ring is two books, book one and book two. You get the second chapter of book one, and then you get the second chapter of book two, and both those chapters are the two most important chapters in the entire novel because they give us all of the background information. So you have what's called exposition, okay? These are terms that come out in plot. Character, let me, let me back up. I've got up here writing about fiction, pages 46 to 49. Yet, other than possibly on the final, I'm not requiring you to write papers. I used to. Stopped a few years ago. Because what I'd rather emphasize is to get you familiar with these few works of literature we're going to be reading and discussing. Because my experience has been with previous students is 5, 10, 15 years from now, you're going to be going about your life and something's going to happen and you're going to go, damn, that's just like, and you're going to remember something that we've read. Usually it's something like Hamlet, because Hamlet, one of my favorite TV series, Ted Lasso, has this character, and the guy says, football is life. He's talking about soccer, English football. Hamlet, in one sense, is everything. All human experiences are found kind of in that play. So these pages, writing about fiction, I'm not requiring you to write, but I want you to read these because it's a series of questions. If you think of these questions as you are reading, whatever it is we're reading, it will help clarify in your mind what you think it means. And then we'll come together and talk, okay, about what does it mean? Does that mean there's roughly 20 people in here, plus me, 21 or 22? Does that mean each of us, our idea about what something means is they're all equally valid? No. Why not? We have different perspectives. We have different understandings of the English language and of literature. I've been teaching this stuff for 31 years. Some of you, you know, your life experiences, well, take that back, all of you, your life experiences are radically different than mine. Each one of us, in that sense, is not only totally unique, but each one of us is totally a minority in this room. There's only one of me, there's only one of you, only one of you, only one of you, okay? Does that invalidate any one of ours? No, but the life experience and the fact I've been teaching this for 31 years does make a difference. You know, there's a book, they required it in some local high schools, something like how to read like a professor. The premise of the book is asinine. It's utterly ridiculous. You want to know how to read like a professor? What do you need to do? It's like how to run like a Heisman Trophy winner. How do you do that? One, play football. And two, win the Heisman Trophy. That's how you run like a Heisman Trophy winner. How do you, you know, become a quarterback like pick your quarterback? Joe Montana, one of my past favorites. Uh, you don't, because there's only one Joe Montana. But his experience enabled him to do things a lot of other quarterbacks couldn't. Okay? So, this first page, some of the questions. Plot. Notice it's the first section in the book after writing about fiction. Does the plot conform to a formula? Um, someone name a movie. I don't care what movie, just name a movie. The Incredibles, great movie, okay? What genre of movie is that? What kind of movie is it? It's animated, right? It's not real. What do they even call real movies anymore? Live action. Live action, thank you. As opposed to dead action? I mean... There's no, another whole problem. Um, does 
does the Incredibles kind of follow a formula? That's a really good, really good answer. Because when it came out, it didn't. That was one of the wonderful things about it. It was, it was very different. It was like, hmm, what do you peg this as? Fantasy? Mm, no, not really fantasy. Cartoon? Mm, no, not really that. Uh, superhero? Mm, kind of. Family drama, relationships, rom-com, it's got elements of all of those. But it does, die hard. Anyone, Fast and Furious. What do you know Fast and Furious is going to involve? Cars. <laughs> or Cars, the Disney, or Pixar, whatever it was. What do you know is going to be there? Cars. They follow, those follow a formula. Die hard. John McClane is always going to get his guy. He's always going to kill the bad guy. Never fails. Because a John McClane that gets killed at the end becomes what? The exact opposite of what the formula is. Okay? So does it have this kind of formula? Tell you right now. This thing, some of you are going to read that and you're going to go, what the hell is he? What is this guy doing? It's about a preacher. 18th, early 18th century New England, shows up to church one day with a black veil around his face and just gives the heebie-jeebies to everybody. Problem is, he never takes it off. His fiance leaves him because he won't even take it off once. She says, just once, lift the veil, show me your ego. Can't. See ya. On his deathbed, he won't let it be raised. There's a reason, okay? But there's no formula that that story falls, follows. No formula in a good man is hard to find. Okay, I'm going to make a reference to the book of Gospel of Matthew as a reference to that title. It's the one with the serial killer. There's all kinds of issues there, all right? What else? What's the source and nature of the conflict for the protagonist? Okay. Two key words there have got to be defined. Conflict, protagonist. Well, everybody knows what conflict is. Conflict is when two things collide. Do they have to physically collide? No. We're in conflict right now. How do I know? Body language, facial expressions. Out there. Probably 90% of you, nah, take that back, let's be honest. 100% of you would rather be somewhere other than right here, right now. Okay? That's part of the conflict. So conflict is where there's some kind of rubbing, abrasion, problem. Conflict is central to human existence. How so? We have to fight for everything we get, right? Not literally but what happens if you don't have a job? What happens if you can't get food? You die, right? So you got to get food. How? Well, you can get a job and work and pay for it. You can steal it. You can kill something for it. That's conflict, okay? Protagonist. What's a protagonist? Most of you, if you heard that word in the English course in high school, it was defined with a two-word phrase. The protagonist of a story. The protagonist of a no Who's the protagonist in the Harry Potter novels? Harry Potter. Why? He's the main character. Main character is not what protagonist means. Protagonist means... Don't write on the board. Protagonist come from two old Greek words. Protos agonisti. Protos means first, foremost, chief. Had my shoulder replaced, totally, completely replaced last fall. What's called a reverse replacement. 
That's where they take the balls that should be here and put it up here, and they take the socket that should be here and make one here. Had a partial replacement six years ago in Chinchwoodsdale. Why did it have to be the blue line? 14 years ago, just like the weather last week, we had a big snow and ice storm. I stepped out my garage door to put a bag of trash in the trash can, and it was like Bugs Bunny on a banana peel. Foot just went up, broke my fall like this. Totally severed all the muscles and tendons in what's called the rotator cuff. If any of you played football, basketball, threw anything in track, you know how important the rotator cuff is, okay? Pain, pain like you cannot imagine. And I've been on fire before also, as a six-year-old, third-degree burns, not fun. Fires, not fun. What, what do you call that? Being in that kind of pain, agony, okay? Agonist was used largely in ancient Greek to describe two athletes. Anybody know who? Goes back to the Olympic Games. Wrestlers. If you've ever wrestled, and you wrestled someone who was good, and you were not as good, that's how my original first pain, shoulder pain, PE course, weight conditioning and wrestling, <coughs> got the shoulder slightly dislocated. The wrestlers were called the agonists, because they didn't have, you know, ancient Greek did not have rules for wrestling. No holds barred. UFC, you know, fighting, essentially. Okay? The proto agonist is the first main chief sufferer. The person who endures the most. Okay? So, what's the source and nature of the conflict with the, or uh, for the protagonist? Um, we could spend the rest of the semester trying to figure that out for this. Why does he put it on? Okay. Oedipus can be pretty clear. And the, the conflict doesn't have to be between two people. It can, be, it can be between an individual and culture. It can be between an individual and the belief system of the day. I'll give you a little hint. For Oedipus, the guy I told the story about kills his father, marries his mother, has children with his mother, etc. Anybody take a wild guess what the conflict is? Fate. How many of you believe in fate? Something is fated to happen. The old Greek idea, if you believe in fate, what does that mean? You can't change it. Period. There are, there are people today, even scientists today, who believe in not fate per se, but what's called determinism. Everything that happens is determined to happen. It cannot be changed. Believe it or not, what you are wearing right now, you didn't choose to do. All that began with the Big Bang, 14, 15, whatever, billion years ago. That set into motion, essentially, this grand game of pool. And we're just billiard balls, billiard, can't say that, billiard balls being knocked around on the table of reality. Bring some duct tape, because we're going to blow up mine. So that's plot. Another example, character. Do you identify with the protagonist? In the Harry Potter novels, you are supposed to identify with Harry Potter. You're not supposed to finish those and go, yeah, I'm a Slytherin. Though a lot of people do. You're supposed to identify with Luke Skywalker, not Darth Vader. He's the guy who kills all kinds of people. If you identify with the mass murderer, there's the door. <laughs> Please leave. Okay? What else? Setting. Is the setting important? How do you know what the setting is in Star Wars? The first one. 
a new hope. How does it begin? Screen, words, pen up. The opening words after Star Wars A New Hope, a long time ago, setting, time, in a galaxy, place, far, far away. In other words, to use another setting from another film, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. It's not here. It's way out there. But in one sense, that way out there is where? Here. William Faulkner, the guy we're going to be reading for Barn Burning, says essentially everything he writes about is about the conflict in the human heart. Most real good literature does that same thing. It turns us inward. Okay. What else can setting be? So we said setting can be time, it can be place. What else can it be? I've mentioned it two or three times. The cultural system. Think of 2024 America and try to put somebody from 2024 America back in Puritan New England. Okay? Take a gay couple from 2024 San Francisco and transport them to Salem, Massachusetts in 1675. Are they going to have a wonderful, long, happy, loving life? No. What's going to happen to them? They're going to get burned at the stake. Not because they're witches, okay, but because they're gay. All right? So that belief system is very important. We're, we'll talk a little bit when we get to you know, drama about the Greek belief system. We'll talk about it when we talk about the ministry of Black Veil, Barn Burning, set in the late 19th century in the deep south Mississippi, where you have people who are no longer slaves, but they're servants, okay? And you'll have people who will refer to them using terms that are not used in public society or in polite public society, okay? Same thing with, where is it? Flannery O'Connor's Good Man is Hard to Find. It's set in the 1940s, probably. Georgia, deep south, white family, good, upstanding, as one of the characters says, good God-fearing, churchly people. And the woman's the biggest hypocrite in the world. Okay? So settings of point of view. Who's telling the story? Is Harry Potter told from Harry Potter's perspective? No. The narrator in Harry Potter is omniscient. Why? Because that narrator takes us in your mind, in your mind, in your mind. We hear what people think. Not because they say what they're thinking. That means that editor, that narrator is omniscient. There are other, lots of stories where we hear what one person thinks. That's limited omniscient. Some stories begin with the character doing the speaking. That is, the character is the narrator. One of the supposedly greatest novels in the English language, written by an American, Herman Melville about a guy who's hunting a great white whale. Anybody know the book? Moby Dick. Anybody know how it begins? Three words. Call me Ishmael. One of the characters, one of the sailors, one of the whalers on the boat is the narrator. He's the one telling us all this. Okay? Symbolism. Probably the reason most of you hate English courses. What does it mean? What do I read out of it? We'll talk about all of that. Okay? So, we'll get ready to go. As you read all of this stuff for Thursday, notice there's a lot of pages in some of these. Okay? In some parts of it, you get little bits of short stories or you get some short... I don't, you don't have to read those short stories. All I'm asking you to do is pay attention to the phrases, words, passages in bold print. Those are the things you need to know, okay? And then, Minister's Black Veil. Our first quiz is going to be entirely an extra credit quiz. And I'm doing that for two reasons. One, possibility to give you some extra credit, or to earn some extra credit. And two, it'll give you an idea of what the quizzes will be like. So the first one won't count against you. 
If you don't take it, that doesn't count as one of those three, okay? Because it's an extra credit quiz. If you do take it, you can earn, I think it is up to 10 points, extra credit. Questions from that quiz may show up on another quiz or on the exam. That quiz will probably, I'll probably put that up, what's that, today's Tuesday, probably on Thursday, okay? And then there'll probably be another one early part of next week, all right? So, bold, bold print stuff, pay attention to, and then read Nathaniel Hawthorne's Minister's Black Veil for Thursday. And, I'm gonna assign this also, William Faulkner's Barn Burning. Barn, barn Burning's a little bit longer, 21 pages, right? This is only eight pages, so that's not too much. Um, but we'll at least get through all of Hawthorne's Minister's Blank Veil and start Faulkner's Barn Burning. Barn Burning is exactly what it's about, it sounds like. It's about a guy who likes to burn barns. He's a pyro, and he's a little bit psychotic. Okay, we'll stop there unless you have questions. Syllabus is on D2L, announcements page, or in your D2L email, or under the content tab of the D2L page for this course. All right. Um, if you came in late, I need to do this. Let me know who you are. I'm going to turn this off.